Hi guys! So today I am, sorry that's my dog, he's a little cross at me for pulling him out from under the covers so that I could sit here. <laughs> this is Eddie. And you can go back to sleep. So today mm -hmm. I'm just doing my book, yeah I know, I'm <laughs> just doing my booktube-a-thon wrap-up. And I managed to finish five of the seven books that I set out to read. Um, I did finish three more on top of that, but all of those ended up being manga. So, uh, yeah, I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. The first book I finished was my book that was older than me, which was Mother Night by Kurt Vonnegut. I ended up giving this five stars. It kind of changed my life a little bit. It was a, it was absolutely wonderful read. It was really fun to read. It was kind of darkly funny and cynical, but it had such a warmth to it. Um, one quote that I really liked towards the end was he meets up with, uh, the main character is like a double agent. He's... American, but he lives in Germany during World War II, and he's working as this notorious Nazi propagandist, but he's secretly also an American spy. And the moral of the story is that, as it says right in the beginning of the book, you are who you pretend to be, so we must be careful who we pretend to be. And at the end of the book, he's meeting up with this, uh, uh, this guy who wants to arrest him as a war criminal um, and has made that sort of his mission in life. And he says, uh, the main character says, I'm not your destiny or the devil either, I said. Look at you, came to kill evil with your bare hands, and now away you go with no more glory than a man sideswiped by a greyhound bus. And that's all the glory you deserve, I said. That's all that... Any man at war with pure evil deserves. There are plenty of good reasons for fighting, I said, but no good reason ever to hate without reservation. To imagine that God Almighty himself hates with you too. Where is evil? It's that large part of every man that wants to hate without limit, that wants to hate with God on its side. It's that part of every man that finds all kinds of ugliness so attractive. It's that part of an imbecile, I said, that punishes and vilifies and makes war gladly. And I think that that passage there is so timely right now. And there are a good large handful of people I'd like to just hand this book over to right now. Um, so yeah. The next book I read was actually a manga that was not planned. <laughs> But, uh, I just, I got it for my birthday, and I couldn't wait to read it, so I just read it all in one sitting, and that was The Birth of Kitaro by Shigeru Mizuki. And this Gegege no Kitaro, which was a long-running series, uh, I don't remember when. <laughs> uh, psh, psh, psh. Yeah, I don't remember when. But, uh, way back when. <laughs> It ran for like 30 or 40 years or something, but uh, we've never gotten it over here. It is like the quintessential yokai manga, uh, yokai being like Japanese monsters, uh, and they're kind of a foreign concept. Like, they can be concepts or like objects or ghosts or animals or more typical monsters, like Kitaro's father here on the front. Um, but actually there's a little essay right at the beginning written by the translator, Zach Davison, who uh, is very good. If you look on Anime News Network, their ANCAST, they had an episode recently that was an interview with him, and he is a very interesting person who had a lot to say about translation, about Mizuki, about Japanese folklore and monsters and ghosts, and I definitely recommend that. But he did a short little essay here in the beginning of the book that talks about basically what yokai are, 
and what the origin of the character of Kitaro, Kitaro is. And um, this is a basically meant to be the first of hopefully several compilations of Kitaro stories. Uh, this is meant to be sort of a best of. It starts with uh, Kitaro's origin story. He's a yokai boy who was born in a graveyard, um, and his father was killed, but his, like, <laughs> his spirit lives on in his eyeball, so his eyeball just, like, pops out of his head and now travels around with Kitaro, who, uh, very conveniently has only one eye, so his father, Medama Oyaji, or eyeball father, uh, can ride along in Kitaro's empty eye socket. Manga! <laughs> um... But this is a great little compilation of some of the best, most memorable stories of Kitaro. It introduces characters like Nezumi Otoko and Neko Musume, who I love. <laughs> and uh, it's just a great little book. I think I gave it five stars, I might have given it four. And yeah, anybody who's ever liked any yokai manga, from Natsume's Book of Friends, to Noragami, to Inuyasha, to Kamisama Kiss, really owes it to themselves to read this book, because Gegege no Kitaro started it all. <laughs> and the next book I read was my book-to-movie adaptation, which is actually an anime adaptation, and that is the first light novel for Kino's Journey, uh, which I'd already seen the anime years and years ago, so I rewatched a few episodes uh, to go along with this, and uh, what I found was, I think that overall I actually enjoyed the book a little better than the anime. And a lot of that has to do with how the anime looks. It's definitely like early aughts, digipaint, it's really ugly. And the quality of the DVD is bad, there's all sorts of artifacting, I don't know what went wrong there. Uh, probably bad masters, that's usually what it is. But, um, from what I understand. But basically this is the story of a young woman named Kino and her talking motorcycle who go, they are travelers who travel to a different country every chapter and uh, they only stay in each place for three days, which is enough to learn about sort of what the place is about and just leave. Um, and so each story is basically a parable, uh, usually allegorical in nature, and uh, what I found was that, for example, like the first story in here is, uh, actually the second story in here, which is the first episode of the anime, is The Land of Shared Pain, and uh, my dog has an itch. <laughs> uh, yeah, yep, I'm sorry. The Land of Shared Pain, and what I found was that in the book, um, you really got more of a sense of why the country turned out like this, and why the man who we meet is the way that he is, and you just get a stronger sense for the country and for the point that it's trying to make about our society. And uh, I found that that was the case overall. Uh, one thing that I did prefer about the anime is that it reorders some of the stories in order to sort of make them more thematically consistent and to make those themes stronger overall, which is often the case in adaptations of anthology stories like this one. Uh, the one that came to mind for me was Mushishi which, uh, particularly in the second season, reorders some of the stories from the last half of the manga, which is already a masterpiece that they managed to make even better by just reordering the stories so that you have stories with similar themes next to each other in order to reinforce those themes and make them stronger overall. This anime does that too. Uh, one example in particular is there's a very short story in here, only a couple pages, called uh, Three Men on the Rails, which is kind of a very obvious commentary on salaryman culture in Japan. 
Uh, and in the anime, because it is such a short story, they actually put that at the beginning of an episode and then combined it with another story that I presume is from a later novel, because it's not in this one, uh, that also deals with salaryman culture, and by combining those stories makes that theme stronger overall. Um, that's actually my favorite episode, it's the one that's stuck with me the longest, I think. And uh, also, this book actually starts with Kino's backstory in the Land of Grown-Ups, and I preferred the anime's method of kind of waiting a few episodes until you get that, so that you get a feel for who Kino is now, um, before you learn about who she was in the past. I like that better. Uh, but yeah, I enjoyed this, and I gave it four stars. The next one I read was a manga, and that was the first volume of Hoshi wa Utau by Natsuki Takaya, who is one of my favorite authors because she wrote Fruits Basket, which is my favorite manga of all time. Uh, this is a pretty simple story about a girl who's uh, living alone with an older brother figure, uh, that guy who I don't think they're related, and uh, basically one night this mysterious boy named Chihiro comes to their house and each of them assumes that he must be a friend of the other, so they have him over for dinner and have a nice conversation and then he leaves and they realize that he's actually a complete stranger. Um, but Sakuya, the main character, is determined to meet him again. And, of course, it turns out that he goes to their school, and it turns out that he's a very different person from what she first thought. And, uh, it's not as strong an opening as Fruits Basket, but I wasn't expecting it to be. Um, <laughs> something I thought was funny was just how much her sense, uh, Takaya's sense of humor has not changed over the years. Uh, Sakuya has, you know, her two friends. One of them's a boy named Yuri, and the other is a girl named Seichan and their comedic dynamic is pretty much exactly the same as Yuki and Kyo from Fruits Basket, where, you know, uh, Yuri says something stupid, and then uh, Seichan has to say something super dry and sarcastic in response. Um, I really hated Yuri as a character. He's basically, like, the nice guy who's been by Sakuya's side all this time, but she never noticed, and... Seems like his entire character so far is just having a gigantic crush on the main character. Um, he also, he fluctuates between being more of a goofy character and more of like a surly Kyo type of character. And I feel, he feels inconsistent to me. I hope that changes in later volumes. Uh, Seichan though, I love and I kind of want to marry her. <laughs> um, and I feel that Chihiro is going to be uh, probably the most interesting character in the series. I'm also, her older brother figure interests me a lot too, because he does seem to care for her a lot, but, for Sakuya, but he works as a potter and he doesn't have a full-time job, so Sakuya has to work all these long, awful hours just to make ends meet for their family, even though she's only like 16. So it's like, he's trying, but... Maybe he's just not the caretaker she needs, and I think that's an interesting and complicated dynamic that you certainly don't see in manga very often. Um, I think I gave this three stars, uh, because it was fine. It didn't blow me away, but it was fine. <laughs> <coughs> the next book I finished was Real World by Natsuo Kirino. She is the author of Out, which I haven't read. This was the book of hers they had at the used bookstore, so it was the one that I got. And, uh, it's about this high school boy who murders his mother and the four high school girls who get wrapped up in that circumstance. And it switches points of view between each of the four girls and the boy. And, uh, I gave it three stars, and my feelings about it are extremely complicated, so I think I'm gonna have to do a longer discussion video about it. Uh, because there were things that I really loved about it, and things that I really hated. So, and not a whole lot in between. Um, I really enjoyed, there's actually a quote that I put on my phone, so I would remember it. 
Hi, baby. I actually do that a lot. I, I, I have to write down quotes that I love. But uh, early on, we have this character, one of the girls, Yuzan, talking to the murderer boy. And the boy says, why? Why do I have to tell somebody else? It's personal, he said. I want to know. How come? Because I want to believe that if I'd been you, I'd have killed her too. And I found myself when, because the chapter right after Yuzon's chapter is from the point of view of the boy. And I found myself thinking that, like, that's what I wanted, was I wanted to understand why he had killed his mother so that I could believe that if I were in his circumstance, I would have done the same thing. I wanted to empathize with him. And when the book doesn't give me the opportunity to do that, because, you know, we learn more and more that this guy is really a pathetic, entitled character, and it's certainly a comment on male entitlement. I have flashbacks to Elliot Rogers and any number of other uh, uh, young male killers. And uh, especially watching him get more and more obsessed with military aspects. There's this story that he remembers from the news of a Japanese World War II veteran uh, getting beaten by, uh, I think, some Indonesians who were wanting revenge for these awful atrocities committed, and he ends up, the murderer ends up embodying that soldier and being like, yes, that's me. Um, and it's very creepy, but it really says a lot about the Japanese relationship with World War II and with the military. I was thinking about all these military otaku anime that are coming out right now. That, you know, obviously that's not a mainstream Japanese thing. But it is a thing that exists that says something about not just Japanese culture, but I think about gender dynamics across the world right now. And, uh... Yeah, like, the fact that we're not allowed to empathize with him, that he's just this pathetic guy who didn't have a good reason for murdering his mother. I think that was one of my favorite parts. And, uh, the next book I finished was my favorite, along with Mother Night. It was A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ozaki. I just want to hug this book's entire essence. I loved it so much. It has such a warmth to it. I love the multiple points of view here because you just feel these characters who have never met just connecting on such a deep level across time and space. And it's just, it's such a beautiful book. Um, I loved the magical realism elements right at the end. I loved both uh, perspectives. I know a lot of people don't like the author's perspective, but I loved those passages too. I love now. I love... I'm just gonna gush all over this book if I keep talking about it, so you're gonna have to wait for me to do a full review because I do have a lot of feelings and thoughts about this book. So uh, look forward to that, I guess. I love the design of the cover. That's what drew me to it to begin with. I just... I love how this book looks so much. Uh, shout out to... Jim Tierney for an excellent cover design. Um, and then finally, I finished that book Sunday night, and I just really wanted some manga. <laughs> so I read some manga, and I started by finishing the last little bit of Utsubara, the story of a novelist. Uh, I gave a tale for the time being five stars, of course, and I gave this one four. Um, I think I'm gonna have to read it again in order to truly fully understand it, but because it is dealing sort of with all of these, like, twins and plastic surgery and, like, hopping around the timeline and all kinds of stuff, but it is a very interesting exploration of plagiarism and what it means to be an author and what it means to be a creator. What is authorship? Um, I felt it was very interesting and surreal, and the art is gorgeous. I love this cover design. Good job, Vertical. Uh, and the art is beautiful. You can see that. 
It is very mature though, so 18 plus. Don't don't read it if you're a child. <laughs> the last thing I read was the first volume of Devil's Line, which uh, I read because I just kind of wanted to read something that was simple and dumb, and this is pretty simple and, and dumb. So <laughs> it's a pretty basic vampire story. Um, you know, definitely has a lot in common with Tokyo Ghoul, which it's clearly, you know, aping a bit. <laughs> but I felt it stood on its own pretty well. It's a pretty pretty standard seinen romance. It's definitely focused more on the romance elements than Tokyo Ghoul. Uh, it's about this guy who is half vampire, um, and he works for a shadowy organization that is, uh, gets involved in devil-related or vampire-related crime in Tokyo, so he takes down vampires even though he is one himself. And he gets involved with a college student named Tsukasa, and there's sort of this sweet romance that develops between the two of them. And I did think that romance elements were very cute, so I'll keep reading it. I hope it's not long. Right Stuff only has three volumes listed right now, but I don't know if that's all there is in the series. I kind of hope so, because I don't think it'll be able to carry very long. Um, and that's everything that I read for the Booktubeathon. I think I did pretty well. Even though I didn't read all the novels I set out to, um, and ended up turning to manga, I think that's okay, because I love manga, and uh, I definitely read more novels over last week than I probably have in the last couple years, so I would call that a success. And it definitely, you know, got me back into reading. Uh, I just started The Handmaid's Tale, which I've been wanting to read for years and just keep putting off, so... I am, uh, definitely have a big stack of books that I can get to next, and I'm excited about that. And it's the first time I've been excited about reading things other than manga and nonfiction in several years, so yay! <laughs> um, and that's all for today. Uh, yeah, see you guys later!